That's a good very good. Uh, our public board of education meeting has started, and we do have a quorum, correct? Yes. Because Chris is on. There's six of us. There's Chris. That's Chris. So we have a quorum, and uh, we will move into executive session. And I will um, entertain a motion to do that for the correct reason. I assume negotiations is part of that, but I, I, I move that we enter into exec session for purposes of discussing negotiations and litigation, litiga litigation. litigation um, and personal personnel issues. Thanks, Pat. Second. Second by Sean, and just go ahead and call the roll, and we'll do it. Rob Ainsley? Yes. yes. Sean Eversley Bradnell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yep. Nicola Fay? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wasley? Yes. Very good. Thank you. And we'll we'll be back and hopefully right on time. So Sean, uh, we have uh, we have a full house, Sean. Um, uh, we have not seen a full house in this room for two years. Uh, it's great to see everybody here, and uh, we are we are back from next session, and uh, we are now in our regular board meeting. And uh, but we are going to do something a little different before we get into the rest of our agenda. Uh, different in that so we have a presentation from the fifth graders at. Beverly J. Martin. So we're going to go ahead and let you all go. Um, and we look forward to that. And then we'll do our humdrum budgets and agenda. But we look forward to hearing from you. So please go ahead. Dr. Brown. Others? Dr. Esch, however you want to get started here. I believe I have my two fifth grade teachers have this nailed down. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. It really warms my heart to be in a room together like this. Thank you for giving us your time. Um, we really want to honor our fifth graders and let them do most of talking. Um, so Stephen and I will just give a really brief introduction to the project. Yep. Hi, guys. It's good to see you and be with all of you this evening. Uh, in fifth grade, one of the science standards that we look at has to do with measuring salt water in the world versus fresh water. And we didn't find anything that was entirely relevant about that question. So we wondered if we could turn that around to something that would engage our, our young people. And something that's been on our mind for a while now is that we've been importing plastic to um, to give our students fresh drinking water, clean drinking water, because we discovered lead in our drinking water six years ago. And for, for those six years, our water fountains have been off. And so we started with a very simple question, was, which was, is our drinking water at BJM safe? <laughs> and from there, we contacted some community experts and decided to test the water and find out whether there was lead in it or whether it was safe to drink. And then in the ELA component, um, we studied the question of how can my voice inspire change? And so the students analyzed different types of persuasive writing and then really honed their skills as persuasive writers, the results of which you'll see in a moment. We're really proud of them and we're so grateful for you letting them come and share. So thank you. Help us remove the water coolers and plastic cups from our school. Our presentation to the school board by Desmond McFay and Henry Martin. As you know, there was blood found in our water in 2015. Thank you for caring about our safety and buying us water coolers. This year, the Life Science Laboratory tested our water and they said there was less than one part per billion in our water. Isn't that outstanding? Because there is no lead in our water. We should get rid of the water coolers and install more water fountains. One reason why we should stop using plastic cups and plastic water coolers is that plastic harms the environment. Our school uses 4,800 cups per month. 4,800 cups would stretch down our hallways six times. 
Those cups end up in the ocean, and animals get tangled up and eat it. Soon the garbage is going to outweigh the fish. You don't want to add to that problem by wasting single-use plastic cups and drinking from plastic jugs. Another reason is plastic cups and water coolers are a waste of money. We spend $90 per month on plastic cups at BPM. We also spend money each month to get new jugs for water coolers. We go through 20 jugs each week, so it must be pretty expensive to refill our water coolers. That money could be spent on things like school supplies if we didn't have the, to keep buying more disposable plastic cups and water coolers. Kids would feel ecstatic if we had more money to spend on school supplies, on rebook, and house supplies, and equipment for the gym. Lastly, our water is clean. Scientists at Life Science Laboratories tested our water for lead. They found less than one part per billion of lead in our water. That means our water has no measurable lead. Isn't that amazing? So we can safely drink from our fountains and faucets. Even though we can safely drink from our fountains, kids still go to the water coolers because we have more coolers than fountains. So the coolers are closer to kids' classes and more convenient. If we remove the water coolers, kids will use the fountains. As you can see, we can remove the water jugs and get more water. Comments. Water jugs and single-use cups are a waste of money and dangerous to our oceans. Also, our water is safe to drink. Please help us get rid of plastic in our school so we can save our future. <laughs>
who the water does by AJ and the Quentin. Can we please get our water sources back? We want to stop wasting plastic cups and jugs. In 2015, there was lead, there was lead found in our water. This year, we tested our water with rice, life science laboratories, and we found less than one part per billion lead in our water. That's really extraordinary. Can we please get our water from it back? We want to stop wasting plastic cups and jugs. We are wasting money in, on our jugs and cups. One reason why we should stop using plastic cups is because it is a waste of money. So we think we spend $90 per month on wasteful single-use cups. Isn't that shameful? We could use that money for better food in the cafeteria and school supplies. There is no point in buying something that you buy and you use once or twice. Then it isn't a trash going to the ocean about to kill the sea animals. Plastic is dangerous for the ocean. Which brings me to another reason why we need to stop using plastic cups and jugs. Plastic is dangerous for the ocean. For instance, plastic ends up in the ocean. Animals eat it and die. There are 26 billion pounds of trash in the oceans. We are adding more trash because we use 4,800 cups per month at our school. We could fit that many t cups in 29 trash cans. Isn't that crazy? Wouldn't you like to not use a lot of plastic because if we were animals, we would be dead. Our water is clean and safe to drink. Most importantly, our water is clean and safe to drink. In fact, we tested our water. Scientists at Life Science Labs and they found less than one part of a billion of lead in our water. That means the amount of lead in our water is so small that it is unmeasurable. You should trust them to test your water because they test water for the whole city. So now we know it is safe to drink from our regular fountains again. As you can see, using water drugs is a waste of our money because our fountain water is clean and safe and plastic kills animals and hurts the ocean. So help us get our water fountains back. <laughs> I really want to thank our kids for stepping up and our uh, staff for teaching them how. And uh, what this leaves you with is a question of how can you support the facilities committee to support Ken and the gang to, we already got rid of half of our coolers and now the kids are like, well, where's the replacement? We have water filling stations and we need six more. So that's what they know, that's what we need. <laughs> Well, Dr. Ash, uh, you have two of the facility committee members, Sean and myself, sitting right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, we're not on the spot. We'll put it on the agenda for next week's facilities committee. We'll have a conversation. I will tell the students I, uh, that sometimes these things take a couple months, if not a year or so, to make happen. But we'll get right on it and see how we can make this happen. You, you've convinced me as one committee member. So. That was the goal of the persuasion thing. Yeah. Yeah. attendance but uh, it's nice when we have great guests like we just had so back to the, we need
need that. Yeah. That needs the door open. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, Slamming the door. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we'll get back down to it. And uh, there's no modifications to Nintendo, correct? I'm already good, right? There's plenty to talk about. Um, and so we'll just roll into public comment period. Hey guys. Thank you. <laughs> I need that for my knees right there. Uh, we're here. Uh, we're receiving uh, public public comment. Right? Public comment. Uh, we have some folks who are listed here. Uh, first up, and I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce someone's name. Please tell me how to pronounce it correctly. But is it Mira Cohen? Yeah. What then? Uh, you stand you like pull a chair up as well, whatever you'd like to do. Right, there should be, there should be a chair up for you to sit at. I had a question just and a few comments about the new proposed plan for if high school next year, specifically about the universal lunch. I think it does propose an equity issue purely because some kids are able to pack lunch and some kids are not. And the kids who are not will have around 1,300 students all trying to get lunch at one time, meaning they will have less time to eat lunch. I think it also has the potential to be really a negative for a lot of kids who have social anxiety or don't like crowds, especially coming out of a year of pandemic. I know a lot of kids are very apprehensive of being around that many students. So that might prevent them from getting lunch because that's a very hectic environment to begin with and then adding that many kids. So I was just wanting to wonder if you guys had any like information we could get and also just put some comments. Thank you. Uh, speaking individually or, or together? Together. Open eye rights, together. Yeah. So is it Ava Sahara? Sahana? I can't read this correctly. Uh, Sahana wasn't able to make it tonight, but Fatu is here. Fatu. There you go. Fatu and Ava, please join us. So, hi, my hey. name is Fatu. I'm the president of IRISE here at Ithaca High School, an organization that is a collective group of students of color who value community, representation, self-determination, equity, and perseverance. We consistently empower and uplift students of color and elevate their voices through persistent change for advocacy, for through persistent advocacy for change, excuse me. We honor our ancestors by, plan, by paving a way for future generations like we just saw to pursue social justice and social reform. Today, we wanna to talk to you about lowering the voting age for board um, decisions. Um, hi, I'm Ava. Most of you know me as Trisha's daughter, but I am a 12th grader at IHS um, and I am the treasurer of IRISE. So why we want to do this in the first place is because we only really start to learn about government and the way that we can participate when it comes to our participation in government class in 12th grade. That should start to happen a lot sooner. So by lowering this age, we could start to um, encourage young people to get involved with government, local government, and they can truly start to learn the value and the importance of being a part of something like that. And a lot of times we hear students complain. They will complain about things that are happening for days and days, but they never know what to do. And so by allowing them to vote in these elections and in these um, issues would then allow them to put their advocacy somewhere would allow them to then use their voices to actually make real change so that they can say that they did something. Um, because we represent students of color and our mission state, our mission statement um, emphasizes <laughs> persistent advocacy for change. Uh, we think that it's imperative that we recognize um, the racial disparity when it comes to voting in our nation. Um, the, the voting rights for people of color have already been threatened and as high schoolers, we need to know how to vote, how to register to vote. Um, and as Fatu said, it happens too late. It happens in 12th grade. Uh, by doing this, you're setting up students to perpetuate this racial disparity in voting. Um, it's, it's very important that we make sure that we know how to vote and we're able to put our opinions out there and additionally, there is a lot of anonymity, uh, anonymity around um, who the administration is and who our members of the board are. Um, and this is something that people always talk about, well, they decided this for us, they, they. People don't know who they're talking about when they're saying they. 
we want to be able to bridge that gap between administrators, board members, and the students that are a part of IHS. By doing this, we build our community, um, especially after the pandemic. It's very important that we're able to build, the, build those bridges between our administration and between the students that go to IHS. We think that it's really important that you consider um, trying to make the voting age lowered uh, and, and doing it relatively quickly because it's important to make sure that students know their rights and are able to exercise them. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, we have Steve Manley, who's going to be joining us virtually. And there will be board responses to um, public comment, and then we'll, then we'll move on. So, Ian. First, Dave. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to say it's a privilege to follow the speakers who I am following tonight. Um, I want to start my thank yous tonight uh, with the teachers and the students who are teaching and learning and practicing advocacy. It's really impressive. And from our fifth graders uh, to our 12th graders, we're seeing it in action. So thank you to everyone making that possible. Uh, my name is Steve Manley. I am the executive director of the Ithaca Public Education Initiative. I am also a parent of a third grader and a kindergartner at Beverly J. Martin Elementary School. My third grader had already told me all of the things the fifth graders shared with you. So their knowledge is being shared uh, through the school. She told me all about what the fifth graders were trying to get done at school. So it's great to see them. Uh, tonight, I wanna give a few thank yous publicly. IPEI raises money throughout the year to make it available to schools uh, across the district, teachers, staff, and students. I wanna thank Steve and Christine for being innovative. We saw it today, tonight here in this room, being innovative in their lesson planning, going beyond their curriculum to connect with student experiences and what they need. IPEI was glad to be a small part of this and the thanks uh, to Steven for pushing us in our application process to be as smooth and as clean as possible, as easy and accessible to teachers and staff as possible. I wanna thank the fifth grade at BJM for their research and their bravery tonight in uh, talking science to power. If we haven't heard that for the last two years, we got to see it in action tonight uh, from some of our young people and it's awesome. Uh, thanks as well to the iRISE students who did the same on a different issue. I wanna thank the community of our donors who support grants like the one you saw, a small grant make possible tonight. These grants fund innovative ideas like these in all the schools in our district. And I wanna thank lastly, members of our board and the community who joined us this weekend at our return to in-person event, Adult Spelling Bee held at Liquid State Brewing Company this raised money for future grants and other IPEI programs. And I wanna encourage you and invite you to take a look at IPEI.org and register for our scavenger hunt, a family friendly downtown event, April 23rd and 24th, or our adult spelling bee round two. Uh, you do not have to participate in round one, though Eldred, I see you. We'll see you for round two, I hope, at South Hill Cider up on the hill on May 15th. Sunday afternoon from two to four. As always, thank you all for leading our district. Thank you to Dr. Brown and his staff, to all the school administrators and teachers for keeping my kids and all our kids safe. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Steve. Any, that's all that's, any others? that's all that's signed up. And Tricia, no one else online, right? Okay, good. Um, board responses at this point? Yeah, I, I would actually like to um, address the question of uh, lowering the voting age uh, because um, two weeks ago our IHS reps brought up the same issue. And um, I am 
as soon as the board meeting was done, I just went online and started Googling because I literally did not know if it was possible. Um, and I discovered pretty quickly that um, federal voting laws, like, like how old you have to be, only apply to federal elections and that state elect state and local elections can actually be decided at that level. And I also saw that a bill to lower the voting age to 16 has been um, introduced into the state assembly. Um, that's about as far as I got that night. Um, haven't really had time to get back to it for various reasons. Um, so I'm a little fuzzy on how the, how that would work at the local level, since there are so many local elective uh, bodies to be considered. You know, does it is it countywide? Can the school board say yes, you can vote in our elections without the county saying you can vote in their elections or the towns or the city? I do not know um, right now. I guess a lot of that is fuzzy. Um, and then I was and then I was thinking back to. The last two times I ran for the board, and one of the things that board members have to do is go out and get 100 signatures. That was suspended during the pandemic, but it's back. You have to go and get 100 signatures of people who are registered voters in the Ithaca City School District um, and turn that in before you can run for the board. <coughs> and so, you know, I walk around my neighborhood, I take uh, I take my little clipboard to the office. And the thing that I found in the last two times is I've been getting older in the place where I work. Everyone else is getting younger because, you know, my friends retire and the young people come in. And there was not a single person in my office under 30 who was registered to vote. So it's. <laughs> Which was a little shocking to me because, boy, I, I went out when I was 18 and signed up and uh, wanted to use that disruptive power. So I, I have seen a, there's not only the, the erasure of voting rights, the attack on voting rights, especially for communities of color, but there is a growing apathy among young people, as you say. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, as one board member, I hear you. I think it would be great. Um, and I'm thinking legislative action. Can look into that. So we have so, a reasonable place to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And and basically, as voters, you vote for a slate of, um, of candidates, you know, of all the candidates, you pick up to three, you vote for the budget or against the budget, you vote on the school budget, you vote on other propositions. But in our ongoing business, only the board members vote. You have elected us or other people and other people to make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So the things that we are deciding um, every couple of weeks are not things that the general public votes on. You're voting on representation. I do not personally have a comment on the universal one right now. Here you go ahead. <laughs> just Thanks, a couple of, uh, just one question, I think. First of all, thank you. That was really good. And your practice for um, <clears throat> standing up for before the Supreme Court by standing there. So, way to go. Ava and Bob? Bob, too. Bob, too. Okay, here's a question. What exactly are you asking us, given what Pat just said about these multiple jurisdictions in which you may be able to vote or may not be able to vote if you reduce the age? I just want to walk out of here explicitly clear. What are you asking us for? We're allowed to respond now? Or is this? Yeah, yeah, this is oh, a direct. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to speak. Um, we're, being, uh, we're being very liberal in them, but yeah. Okay. So, Especially with students, yeah. We want to hear what you have to say. So, there is a local organization um, called Youth Council Ambassadors, 
and it is youth in the community, um, all of Tompkins County, and they are meant to represent the youth in our community that are in school and outside of school. Every year we pick a mission um, to work on. This year we are working on a teen center because um, there is an increasing problem in you know, finding a space for young people to go to instead of just taking to the streets or whatever, especially after the pandemic. But last year, our mission was lowering the voting age, and it was the issue the year before that. Um, I think that in terms of figuring out the logistics, Youth Council Ambassadors has done a lot of research that can help all of us educate ourselves on how to lower the voting age, how that can be feasible, um, what our time frame would look like, uh, and also how we can start an initiative to help young people uh, regain that excitement when it comes to voting. I, I pre-registered as soon as I got my permit, um, my driver's license, and I'm really excited to go out and vote for my first time. But uh, we, we do need to do research, I think. Um, and we're also asking to go out and go beyond the people in this room go out into the school and say, would you like to vote? Hear from the students, um, especially on that last point, we want to connect our board members to the students. We want to see you in our schools. We want to be able to communicate with you. Um, so I think that is what we're asking. Um, adding on to what Ava was saying, I know you brought up that like you were doing research and that like it was only on like the federal level that you really found like restrictions for. And I believe that like, I think we're asking I think a start for the district level here for our district for students that are 16 and older to be able to vote um, on certain issues that will help students like Ada said get connected know who's on their board know who makes decisions for them and like you said we're electing representation so in that sense get to know what that is and get involved in like our local government and so um, I've also been a part of YCA and those um, extensive like days that they spend doing research about these things is another good outlet for um, figuring that out but i think just lowering like starting with the district first um, is what we're looking for thanks uh, other board members other students you're going to speak soon but go ahead go ahead um well i had i had a question for mira hi yeah um so if if my math serves me right, um, you said 1,300 students, right? 15, yeah. Pardon, sure. how, how long would this universal lunch period be? Well, I'm just going off of the oh, I, yeah, um, With that, so it would either be 45 minutes. So I think it would be great, Dr. Brown, Lily, if you're on the call for there to be some presentation. I got an email with the slideshow. I couldn't make that meeting, but I think it would be it would, be, it would be best to just all to be able to respond appropriately if we all saw the same information. Yeah. And that's not, not to answer your question. I just don't oh, have the information I to don't respond know. appropriately. Oh, I, they're just two proposed schedules and I've been there. Sure. Adam, is this going to be part of your speech during the time of the student reps or you're uh, doing no, saying something this different? Is, um, this is the response. To oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming uh, to voice your concerns. Um, the four of us actually met with uh, Mr. Trumbull and the um, our building administration um, on this topic yesterday during lunch. Um, with and this whole scheduling thing is really more of um, uh, an issue specific to IHS rather than district matter. But um, I hope I can answer some of your questions. And I also want to let you know that we actually brought up many of the same concerns that you just did um, yesterday. Um, the current plan is for. Um, the data stay very similar to what it is now, um, but with every class period to be extended by two minutes to 47 minutes, and I believe the lunch would be 35 minutes long, um, which I agree with you. It's, it's concerning. That's not much time when we have about 1,400 kids in the school. Um, and I think we kind of estimated that like 60% of them at least probably rely on the cafeteria for their food every day. Um, that's that's concerning. That that could leave some people with a five minute lunch if at all. Um, so we have been working um, a to uh, get as much feedback as we can 
um, on this system um, from students like you and everyone else. So it's, it's really great that this one was even concerned. Um, as well as to try to figure out potential solutions if this does go through. Um, it seems like uh, the administration is pretty intent on it happening. Um, and there are some ideas about expanding the locations where food can be offered, um, as well as opening up practically the entire school um, as an eating space um, so that not everyone is condensed to the into the cafeteria, which is kind of impossible. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, there could, there could be uh, multiple lunch lines um, using the concession stands and all of that. Um, so yeah, um, if you, with issues like, we could also um, get in touch and we can invite you to another meeting with the building administration. Um, and also if you'd like to bring friends or whatever to voice more of your concerns, um, that is definitely an option. And we are continuing to work with the building administration to create more forums and more places where people can come in and talk about the schedule and really be more transparent about the process of, you know, how do we make these decisions and how do we decide what the future of ISS will look like. Thank you. Looks like we have another okay. LACS student wants to contribute to this conversation yeah. before we move on. Well, I, I love your point. I fully back you in what you're doing. I mean, we go to LACS, we love democracy. That's like our whole shtick, but we really agree with you. Um, I'm curious to go to the lunch thing. We don't know, me and Andrew, I mean, said LACS, why is this decision happening? Um, essentially, so currently we have three lunch periods. Um, most, I think about 85% of the school has a lunch period. I think between 15 and 20% have opted out of the lunch. For um, the master schedule this year was pretty funky and a lot of people opted for a lunch, but the schedule worked out in a way where they had to have a study hall instead of a lunch. Um, and also there have been issues with meeting um, the state requirements for instructional time on um, our schedule. We have a, we actually have a relatively short day schedule um, and the state has been telling us we need to increase the amount of time students spend in classes or else it's not funding. Um, so um, that, that's one issue and also um, the administration wants to ensure that everyone has a chance to take a break and eat and socialize during the day. Um, however, there are also you know people who currently choose on their own to forego that option. So you know there are there are pros and cons to all of this. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the reason behind the approach to change the system. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Grace, do you want to spend that? How about Grace just pulled up the, the slideshow. Mike, you guys said um, that you got the presentation right now. No, we, if you have children at the high school, you probably got it. We, we would uh, bring them into trouble at a future meeting. And right. They're gathering feedback and looking at options now. We are not near a decision, just an information gathering state right now. We appreciate that. And um, right, we, have, we haven't dug into this yet, and uh, we look forward to that presentation and be able to uh, get more background uh, what's uh, being proposed. Board, board responses. First to uh, the BJM fifth graders, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicole LaFay, for um, asking us to create space in our agenda for that sort of presentation, the very definition of uh, learning being brought to the board. And um, I'm just very thankful that that's the kind of thing that uh, makes being on the board worthwhile. So that was great to see. Especially I think you may have known one of the presenters as well. Um, but that, that was that was <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, maybe yeah. see the room for it. That was fantastic. Um, uh, regarding the universal lunch, I'm going to be interested in this conversation. I know what comes to me on a regular basis around issues of equity uh, that folks uh, have been forced to opt out of having a lunch and trying to find ways to make sure that everyone has access to a lunch just to take a break. So I'm going to be intrigued to see how this works out with all the um, considerations that need to be had whenever we're talking about running an organization of 1,400 people plus a number of staff, students, faculty, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, to uh, Ava and uh, Fatu, uh, I've been involved with uh, 
the youth council uh, in October. We were having a conversation about whether this is possible and taking a look at some of the legislation um, in regards to whether or not this could be a school district decision. I don't think that we have um, a legal decision on that yet. Uh, but one of the things I know that we can do as a school district, as a school board, is put our full weight behind the committee that's trying to make this law uh, to lower the voting age to 16. Um, if I, I just pulled the bill up here, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, bill uh, three, six X Senate bill three, six, six. And so we'll keep taking a look at that. And um, I would hope that maybe we would put it on a legislative advocacy committee. And with that being said, I'm aware that part of the ways in which systems maintain themselves is by sending something to a committee. <laughs> Right, because then it goes to a committee, then we talk about it, then we write a report, and then we have another committee to take a look at that report and get back. And so I'm very much aware of how that game is played, and I've watched it throughout my career and been a part of it and trying to advocate against it as well. With that being said, that's not how our committee operates. We get stuff done. Well, that's, that's precisely the point that I was going to make is that we have examples of uh, the Ithaca City School District Legislative Advocacy Committee, committee actually passing laws that affect the entire state. So we have a we have a, a playbook by which to go to, and so it's been done. Um, I'll expect well, uh, our, our chair is is, uh, is is should probably chime in here virtually. What do you think, Aaron? Should we take this on? Yeah, I'm. So I'm I'm a little confused. We're taking on universal lunch and the voting age. Universal lunch is no. That's not a legislative <clears throat> thing. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I got mixed in what we were discussing. The voting age then is what we're. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We, then, we yeah, absolutely. Age 16. No, I had already put that in my notes to add to our next agenda. Perfect. Excellent. Um, All right. So we'll, we'll be sure to communicate when that's on the agenda as well. And we'll do additional research in the meantime to see what is possible. And, and all committee meetings are open to the public. It's, a, it's an open meeting um, there. You can, it's much more informal than this. You can take part in conversations, ask questions. Um, very few people have attended our meetings, but they do when something's really, really important to them. I would like to extend an invitation actually to those of you who just spoke at this meeting about the age, please come to our next meeting, which is, uh, I'll, I'll get the confirmation of the date from Trisha. Chris Malcolm, do you, uh, do you wish to weigh in? Um, if I tried to, I'd be redundant. I just want to uh, shout out the BJM children who did an awesome job, but also um, thanking the students coming out and their participation. Um, it's actually in inspiring um, where some people are choosing to be on the sidelines, they're actively engaged and it's, um, it, you guys made my night, so thank you. Thanks, Chris. So, so let's move on. And so uh, student reps and LACS, why don't you uh, go ahead with your prepared remarks? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, LACS has been doing really well. We, our school reacted a lot to the decision to end the mask mandate. We had an EASM or an emergency ASM, which is where you had to have a hundred? Fifty students and fifteen staff vote to host an emergency all-school meeting to talk about the mask mandate because our staff and students have been kind of we're the most pre-mask heavy school, and so we all kind of reacted of like, hey, are you guys comfortable with this? Are you not comfortable with this? We actually it was a really good discussion. Uh, we had it in our third period, and it went really well. Our community <coughs> kind of settled into the idea, and I think it impacted a lot of students of their decision of what they were going to do the next day. So this is the day the news came out, not the day that went right. in place. And students, we're still a pretty mask heavy school. Uh, students are slowly becoming more and more comfortable not, but it's been a good transition. And I think I credit a lot of that to having that community discussion in our gym, which because we had, or yeah, something, thank you again. Uh, yeah, that was, it was a really good discussion in our school is become comfortable with the decision. So we are in the middle of the third quarter. Um, during the fourth quarter, our school, um, we changed from our typical schedule and we, we begin these, these trips. So as a student, um, you will actually on Friday, I think is when you can sign up, 
um, on Friday or tomorrow, people are going to go around um, the school during sixth and seventh period and, and, and check out some of these various trips. And then on Friday, people are going to sign up for trips. Um, and you, you, know, you sign up for a trip and then you meet every Thursday for pretty much the whole day on Thursdays. Um, and, you know, so there's, uh, and then each, all the trips will kind of, there's a, there's a week where all the trips get to take the whole week to do like their thing. It's called Trips Week. So some of the trips like, um, like the Aquasasne um, aid trip and the canoe trip and the rock climbing trip will, will go, you know, they'll leave Monday morning, they'll come back Friday afternoon and they'll spend the whole week, you know, wherever they decide to go to. So the canoe trip will spend the whole week, you know, canoeing around. The rock climbing trip will spend the whole week, you know, climbing <laughs> on rocks. <laughs> Um, and then the Oxazni, or it's called the Oxazni cultural, cultural exchange trip. That's that's a trip that's connected to a certain you know certain service class um, at the school. And so the students in there have been kind of researching a lot of like service and also like indigenous culture and stuff. So they're going to go. This has been a very long running trip. So we have a we have a partnership built up um, with the you know the Oxazni nation. Um, and they're going to go there and you know last time they were there they helped you know like rebuild a barn you know and so they just kind of do, do stuff and hang out there and, and and talk with the kids you know basically you hang out there for like it's a pretty cool time yeah and then there's also obviously you guys remember spanish trip i thank you for ordering citrus they are shipping currently so you'll get them probably next week and we also have container leaf trip is where a group of students go down to New Orleans. We go back to the same neighborhood every year. We build multiple different houses. We help paint the community and that kind of thing. We also have a couple other trips that are more minor, but these are kind of more like big earth trips. Yeah, the big, yeah, we call them, those ones are called away trips. Um, yeah. So that means they spend the whole week away. And like Spanish trips goes to, I think, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, yeah. Because yeah. um, of your citrus plots. thank you. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and then the other thing that we're going to be doing is next week on Friday, so during the district conference day, we're going to be bringing in juniors to do their PBATs. And so PBAT stands for um, performance based assessment task, yes. they're calling it, yeah. um, which is basically our alternative to the regents' exams. So this, this, this period, people are going to be giving their English PBATs. And so their English PBATs are a, um, uh, you have to, it depends on the class that you do it for, um, but generally, you it's basically a media analysis. So in the, you know, in in my year when I did my PBAT, I did a song analysis. So I chose a song and kind of analyzed it and its kind of cultural connections and and so on and so forth. And then you make a presentation and you give that presentation to a kind of a panel of of graders basically who will then evaluate you know based on your actual analysis. Um, and then the paper that you write to accompany the presentation, and then also your present, um, and then, yeah. So that's our alternative to PBATs. And so that's that's what the English PBAT looks like. The social studies PBAT is is very similar. It's a research paper and then a presentation. And then we also have PBATs for science, which is just a general kind of like you know design an experiment, conduct it, give a lab report, and then also PBAT in math, which is find a kind of a bit more straightforward is you know find a tricky math problem and, and do it and then demonstrate how you did it. Um, and generally, that's that kind of work is already incorporated. And, and so, so all the classes that eleventh graders will take, um, any class an eleventh grader is taking, uh, most of them are kind of PBAT classes where the, the the course of making this task is directly integrated into the curriculum. So you know all of my classes kind of you know I have a lot you know all my classes are with eleventh graders, so we kind of flowed into the PBAT period at about the same time, and it kind of was a very natural progression. It was very integrated with the coursework. So people wrote their PBATs, and then they're going to be presenting them on Friday. And that's, that's all from us. Yeah, that's Great. Thanks, Alicia. Sophia? Um, yeah, first I'd like to mention that it's great to be part of a full house in person for the first time. Mm. Um, an experience. Uh, the BJM students did an amazing job with their presentation. Uh, I was very impressed. Um, also, thank you to Ava and Vatu for furthering the conversation around voting. And I look forward to continue talking about the new schedule at IHA for next year. Um, these past two weeks have gone by pretty smoothly for IHA students. There have been many exciting events like Cabaret Night hosted by the IHS Orchestra last Friday. Many talented students performed impressive and memorable acts for a packed cafeteria. Winter Formal held at the Celebrations Event Center 
on Saturday night was an awesome experience. It was the first school dance other than prom since COVID. Moving on to the topic of performing arts, the annual choir theme concert is this Friday night at Cobb Auditorium. The theme this year is Weather Report. Last week, our wind ensemble and concert band performed for the feature of the IHS band, the eighth grade band of DeWitt and Boynton Middle School. It was great to hold the combined band concert again and share music in person after two years. There are also multiple murals happening at IHS, helping, helping to shape IHS into a more safer and representative space with the PML, BL, BLM mural currently being painted by our students in the art hallway and our AAPI mural in the process of being finalized. We have had great success in our indoor track team with five students placing top 20 in multiple events at the state team. Student athletes are gearing up for spring sports, which is very next year. Also, uh, Code Red Robotics is heading to the Finger Lakes Regional Competition on Tuesday, on, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday after two years of cancellation. Uh, the team, led by our very own Andrew McCracken, um, has spent uh, the last two months building a 115 pound robot and are excited to see it compete. Uh, if they win in Rochester, they can go to the World Championships in Houston. In other school related news, we are working with the building administration. Um, to advance a plan to implement a pass-fail or credit-no-credit credit, uh, system to be available for students by the end of the year. Um, I must say as well, I was so incredibly impressed by the presentations given by the BJM fifth graders. I didn't need, need much convincing, but they had me totally convinced. Um, and I must say the same applies for the high school. Um, there are a lot of coolers and a lot of cups, um, and I, I, I doubt that the situation is much different uh, in terms of the quality of the water at IHS than at BJM, and it would be really great to see um, the reinstitution of the water fountains uh, in replacement of all of the plastic jugs. Um, so the other student reps and I um, were wondering if the board could give us an update on the bus driver, nurse, and custodial shortages uh, throughout the district. Um, has the district changed its approach um, in the past few months in, in attracting uh, new district workers, and has there been any progress um, in just in hiring? Um, new nurses, bus drivers, and custodial workers. Um, the country is also still struggling with a nationwide teacher shortage. Um, and the students re reps are wondering if ICSD has begun recruiting um, new educators for the 2022-2023 school year um, as it's quickly approaching. Um, it is imperative that ICSD be aggressive um, in recruiting uh, teachers for the upcoming year, especially teachers of color um, who are in high demand throughout the country. Um, the mask mandate has ended and many students and teachers are enjoying the new ability to choose. Um, however, mindful of the current pan of the continued pandemic, the majority of the student body at the high school still wears the mask. Uh, the latest Tyler issue has also come out featuring articles about recycling, personal devices, and much, much more. The reps to the board would also like to thank the IRS officers for their presentation supporting a 16 and 17 year olds voting in Board of Education elections. The issue of allowing 16 and 17 year olds to vote has gained a lot of traction in the high school. Students are talking about it. It was actually a discussion um, in government class. I've also talked to countless students in the high school that are all in favor of this issue. Allowing them to vote in Board of Education elections will give them a greater stake in the policies that affect them. 16 and 17 year olds are, all, are already often part of the local communities. They have jobs as volunteer and are more than conscious of political issues. Um, this specific issue has really invigorated students. A lot of the people I've talked to want to come to board meetings to advocate for it. It's clear that students want this, and they want to have a greater voice in their local community and exercise their civic duty. Thanks, Olivia. I have board responses. Uh, I'll give you one more follow-up to the idea of voting age. If voting didn't matter, we wouldn't make it so difficult to have. <laughs> Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, Zara, yeah. if, if you could just summarize for us so we can, as a board, understand what your major discussion points were for your EASM regarding the ending of the mask. Students were really surprised. A lot of students kind of felt like it was kind of a big shock, like having to do it quickly. Um, 
students, there was a couple of students that were like, well, I'd rather wear my mask because that means I didn't have to social distance. That was kind of a common point. I led the ASM in the gym with my friend Stella. And that was kind of a root. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that was, there was also a level of like, well, this, for even in ASM, that's maybe around 300 students in a gym, but they weren't masked. Is that still something that we're comfortable holding? Or because that's, I mean, if there's a person that's COVID in there, that's that's a high risk. Like that just doesn't work. Like, but we can't put in any sort of mandate into the room itself because it's not our like our own situation. So, do we? What's our solution to that? Um, it wound up being a very kind of repetitive conversation of if you're comfortable, if you're not comfortable. But it was also the point of the ASM wasn't to see if what's the solution. It was kind of for students to err. I am comfortable with this or I'm not comfortable with this. And that's when the community kind of came together of, well, there's some that aren't, but also how our community needs to, if you are going to not be masked tomorrow, how are you going to approach things that are? And then vice versa, or and how to be respectful and having that conversation. Mm -hmm. And it, it's gone great. There hasn't been any, I mean, students are still discussing, but it's become kind of we all had a conversation about it, so it was a little bit more comfortable, like we're more comfortable with each other, even if we're not comfortable with the other. Yeah, uh, if I can add on to that. Yeah, he led in the gym or in the library. I did. I led in the so. library, which which so the library we opened up as a kind of an overflow space for people who aren't comfortable, you know, being in the whole gym with everybody. There were about you know two dozen people in there. Yeah. Um. So it was it was a kind of quiet conversation, but it was still good. Um. But we went through many of the points that. You know, that Jim went through. And I think um, one of the biggest takeaways, you know, like Zara said, you know, we weren't trying to find a solution. Um, we were trying really to just kind of everyone to air their concerns. I don't know, um, and I don't think there's any way to say any way to say for certain if the discussion really did change anyone's mind. Um, but I do know, you know, I was talking with people uh, age period on Wednesday, um, which was, you know, the, the end of the day. The day that the masks were removed, and you know, kind of people were like saying that they went into the day feeling kind of pretty kind of stressed about it, but it turned out to just be a very normal school day. And I think I do attribute a lot of that to the fact that we came together as a community, um, discussed this kind of very sudden thing that we were all suddenly facing, um, think about how we all felt about it, talked about it to each other, and then ultimately. I mean, ultimately, go on with our lives, but we had a bit of a broader perspective about what people were thinking, and so it's you know things are pretty normal. Some people are choosing to wear the mask, some people aren't, and that's just it's not really a big thing, you know. It's not like a, oh, you know, this person wearing the mask is oh well, and this person is. Um, it's just you know, it's people's choice. Other board responses. I um I just want to let y'all know um. Between the talking about masking and then also the the voting age, the um, the next meeting is April twelfth for a legislative advocacy committee, and then also an excuse. I've been my kids have been coming in and out, and my brain is just done because I, I keep getting confused. So sorry for any flubbing, which there's a lot of. But um, you know, y'all are talking about water a lot, and BGM's presentation was amazing. I would love to hear more from you because um, what I find to be a little bit of a, a catch 22 is that, you know, on the legislative advocacy committee, we're working on school lunches. And one of the issues is the amount of sugar in them and that's in the drinks. And so, you know, I'm all for no one serving bottled water. We know how terrible that is for the environment. Um, but how do we handle getting rid of water, but also making sure students are drinking something that is also sustainable. So, you know, I would love to, and I'll reach out to BJM as well, but I would love to hear from students about how, okay, so we want to get rid of, you know, we want to just have water fountains that we can refill bottles. Well, what about near the lunchrooms where students need to have a beverage with their lunches? I would love to hear from you on how to solve this because juice and chocolate milk and soda pop are just not going to cut it. And I see a hand raised and I would love to listen now. Go for it. Okay. LACS 
in our main office, we kind of our school has been wanting to cut back on the plastic cups too. We've been giving out water bottles for free. Uh, parents have been coming in to hand them out. Uh, also, there's been some interest in getting paper cups instead, just so they can still have the option. Uh, and also, we haven't had a vending machine since like 2018, so we weren't really dealing with that aspect, so I can't talk about that. But the sense of water, either paper cups or giving out reusable bottles, has seemed to be a good solution for us. Um, as for Thanks. other, um, as, as for the high school, I think kind of similar thing. I think that it, a transition to paper cups would be great. Um, also, I've seen a few of these like new fancy water fountains around the school recently. That'd be great if we could have many more of them, but they're like you know the water bottle filling thing, and also like a normal water fountain. Mm -hmm. So you know, kids on their you know, we need to drink during class can drink from the water fountain and instead of these paper cups near the cafeteria or really anywhere. Um, kids can fill those up. Um, another potential solution to look into, I've been like seeing boxed water around in like cafes and sandwich shops and stuff. I've seen it become more and more popular. Um, if that could be looked into as a solution, you know, and something that can be added to the big cooler sugary drinks that's in the lunch, that's by the lunch line, um, that, that would be really great, I think. My understanding with most cartons though, right? Same with like coffee cups, they appear to be paper, but they actually have a plastic lining. So you can't even actually recycle them. It's actually almost worse than an aluminum can, borderline plastic bottle. So I think we should explore everything and I love the ideas. And if y'all wanna come on the 12th, come, you can email me anything, but um, I, I need your minds to help, you know? We need more, more ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, anyone? Uh... Yeah, um, just like on the topic of water, um, LHDS mentioned that they uh, hand out free water bottles, right? And I think that uh, to combat like the sugary, you know, the drinks, um, we still have to pay for water if we want like a water bottle at the vending machine. Um, and it's when I forget my water bottle or whatever, I usually have to like pay like a dollar fifty for water, which I don't think it's the most ideal. So I think it'd be great if we also looked into giving out free water, like bottled things at school. We, we did do that for a while. We had a whole bunch <clears throat> in the main office. So I mean, we could probably even look for ways to getting bottles donated from different organizations in town. I don't know if we could figure out an IPEI grant to pay for some of that. But we, we, right, we six, didn't have bottles. Right, six years ago at the elementary schools, it was basically an initiative at every elementary school. But um, yeah. but we'll talk more about water. Um, <clears throat> anyone else responding? Hey, yeah. Rob, I just yeah. wanted to uh, respond to the question regarding the hiring um, within the school district. Ladera did a great presentation at the last, last HR meeting, and Bob could probably speak to it in more detail. Um, but we have always been actively and aggressively recruiting um, across the board and we continue to do so. Um, she's got several events coming up where she's reaching out to especially um, um, individuals of color and BIPOC um, and trying to recruit and get them to come to Ithaca. And uh, I will try, I just looked in the HR agenda and the presentation wasn't there um, and we'll try to get that out to you folks to share that information. That'd be awesome. Thank you. But to your point, Chris, it was very, it was a very encouraging uh, report from Glidger, detailed and really going down all the openings in the district. And many have been filled, Bob. But it was, uh, if you wanted to speak quickly to it, uh, but we're glad to provide the real, the real numbers. But, I'm just trying to pull it up too, but. Um... So uh, we had 10 bus driver trainees. Two of them have passed their CDL. Uh, six of the remaining eight have signed up for their road test. That is, uh, it's, it's not easy. Neither of those tests are easy to pass. It right. takes all months, worth, months and months worth of training in some cases. Um, and so that's really encouraging in terms of bus transportation. That's, that's at LACS has been um, problematic for years. Um, nurses, I know uh, we were 
hiring one and had one more that was waiting for the contract to be passed because, um, and I think the board will vote on that next board meeting, um, and that's a really good contract for nurses coming up. So that might help us pull in another nurse. Um, and custodial, I know uh, yeah. uh, Dan and I were just texting each other. I think there's coming a little six. down to six. Six, yeah. And that was from a high of maybe eleven or twelve. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so yeah, we're getting we're, we're getting really close. We have drop in uh, hiring every Thursday. Um, we definitely need the new contracts to help as well. And so we will. And there were other positions, but Blair Galdier went down the list of all the openings, and you really uh, closed the gap quite a bit. And but we'll share that information with. Uh, with everyone and uh, push that out, that'd be great. Um, H HR committee did go through it all. So um, any anything else right now? We'll, uh, one small question for Andrew. The um, performance benchmark or PBATs. Okay, the PBATs. Are they all individual or are they, so no teams have coalesced around a, a larger project there? Yep. Each individual student right now. That is correct because um, it's it's uh, I mean it's it's, it's a regions alternative and the, and the point is to kind of assess the point is to the point in moving away from the region test is that we don't like tests we don't like standardized tests we think that they are a a bad metric to measure students you know academic success um, especially because it's a very I mean. You go into the, the way we do tests, you know, you go into like the testing room. It's like at our school, we got to do it in like the cafeteria or the theater or the gym. It's like a silent room. There's, you know, there's these tables, you know, and it's very much like a, um, I, it's not like an impressive atmosphere, but it's very much not a very comfortable like space. So we think that um, the, the two big benefits of PBACs are that, you know, um, it is it assesses you on multiple levels, you know, not just checking off boxes on, on a piece of paper. And also that it is more comfortable because a lot of the graders are actually, you know, teachers that you may have, you know, known and teachers that, you know, are not completely like just a random person off the street. Um, so you, you know, you feel you know, people who do get socially anxious presenting can feel a bit more comfortable in that, you know, situation. Um, so I did go off on a tangent there, and I apologize, but they are uh, they are entirely individual and not real. I, I have to imagine that my colleague learned something about what those tests are. I just wanted to know if there's any, been, been any thought about a combining project there. So thank you. Very good. Thanks. We do need to move on and consent agenda. And then Dr. Brown, you get to uh, must have something to say tonight, and we're going to get to that. We have budget to get to and a few other things. So, uh, consent agenda is in front of you, and you've had a chance to devour it, and motion, and et cetera. I move, move the consent agenda. I move the consent agenda. <laughs> Second. As presented, and thank you. As presented. The Ukrainians won tonight, uh, so thank you, Pat. And uh, uh, we've been seconded. Any questions? And uh, if not, um, I think it's all pretty straightforward. If we could uh, call the roll, please. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Erin Flores? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicole LaFave? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Watson? Yes. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Brown? Thank you for the opportunity to stay here. And I don't have much to say uh, right now. Um, just want to note for the board and the community that this is the time of year where we see retirements show up on the consent agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Eschbach was here earlier. We will celebrate her later. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Allen is along mm -hmm. tonight. He was a, he's been a staple in the school community for a long, long time. Oh, and Angela Jordan. Um, mm -hmm. We will celebrate her later too. But just to note, this is the time of year to look at the consent agenda and to recognize and appreciate the brilliance of some folks who have spent a lot, a long time in the school district. Uh, thank you to all of them. And with that, we will bring up to help me with budget uh, the person who's trained, been trained by Angela, myself, and uh, Amanda Verma. Uh, Amanda, we're going to talk about some budget. 
for 2022, 2023. It's an ongoing year-long process for us. And we wish to bring some most recent updates in anticipation of an upcoming overall budget presentation, hopefully the first meeting in April. So Mr. Burke. And Amanda, great. it's okay to sit. That's great. You didn't, we're not going to make you stand through. I'm going I'm to sit through this one because it's a little more narrative and it is really a review of things that you know, but um, a good reminder as we go into the budget process. And I do um, I do want to say I, I, I hope there was a little hesitation there letting Angela go. All of you know she is just an absolute treasure. And so we are going to be fortunate enough to um, have her help us and consult with us next year and train whatever the future may look like in the business office. But um, all of the work that you see, everything that we've learned, I mean, that, that is just, that is a one-stop shop for, um, you know, historical perspective and, and really how to do things with just such a beautiful authenticity. I think it really reflects in the work that we bring to you as the board and the community at the committee levels as well. So, um, so tonight, I just, Trisha, I, I, actually, I don't mind, if you don't mind going back to that very first slide, I just want to be really clear here. So we're, we take to the voters, right, uh, the general fund budget. And uh, for a couple of years now, I know, especially Eldred has really asked me specifically and then the team to really make sure that the community remembers that the general fund budget is one part of the budget. That's the one that we vote on, but there's other budgets that we also use to support all of the work that we do in the school district, right? And so the special aid fund is one that we've talked about in the past. It's typically where our grants go, our federal grants, our local grants, our state grants. And so tonight we are gonna be focusing on that special aid fund specifically because of the um, American Rescue Funds, right? The SORSA and ARP monies that we received um, through the federal government that were related to COVID, but that we as a district, of course, take that and we say, well, what can we do better here? Yes, we address COVID, but we also think that we can use these based on the way that we're supposed to expend them in a way that really supports our education, our teaching, our learning, and our community. And so as a reminder, the reason why we're going to do this, and we talked about this the last meeting, is that this, these funds for this current year are part of the general fund, but for next year, they actually have to be pulled out and placed in the special aid fund. And so tonight, Dr. Brown and I wanted to make sure that we went through as a reminder, all of those amazing programs and supports that are going to look like zeros in the general fund, but they are gonna show up over in the special aid fund. And when I give you that line by line um, budget that we give at the finance committee next week, we will be sure that I will like highlight any time that you might see what by just the naked eye looks like a budget reduction. It's not. It's a transfer for a year or two, right? Because um, the the SURSA funds we have one more year next year, and then the ARP funds we have two more years next year and the following year. And so our sort of our plan is we move those over now, and then we'll bring them back over the next couple of years as we bring in the revenue back into the general fund of the things that we want to sustain. Okay, so that sort of sets the stage for this presentation. Trisha, the next slide is the numbers itself, right? And so you can see there, the only things that have changed really, we did submit um, our formula uh, to the comptroller. So we have a real number uh, for the, the tax cap formula. We have um, the federal aid, is, that's that orange line across the middle, that is the um, ARP and, and SURSA funds that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, we do still have some estimations on if we wanted to get to a balanced budget. Again, these are recommendations to get to a balanced budget. And then that budget number on the bottom is what we would be striving for as we make discussions and as we sort of take a look at um, what that budget component, what the budget components are. And again, you'll know, you'll get more details as we get those line by line items that will expand the last meeting. So the next slide, Tricia, is um, just an overview essentially of what is online, right? And so this will have a little bit of modification this year if there were things that um, just need a little more explanation, but we're gonna pretty much go through this. And so Tricia, the next slide, is uh, essentially, this is the slide that's about maximizing in-person instruction. 
and you can't see it really here because of that little bar, the Zoom bar, right? But um, so maximizing in-person instruction, there were a lot of things that we committed to using the ARP and SIRSA funds for, and all of these things really, they have all come to fruition. And so we have used um, monies to support additional um, classrooms as well as literacy supports in grades K through five. We've expanded um, because we had to lessen the number of, of students in classes, teachers took on extra classes. So for example, if I taught English nine, right, I might take on a couple extra sections and then we would give them an extra 0.167 for that. Educational support professionals or TAs and aides, noon hours, that also is for TAs and aides, art and music for integration, and then substitute teachers. We did want a list that wasn't actually on the list online, but we have been using them in a number of ways, right? To give teachers and staff the opportunity to be able to take care of themselves and their families if they were sick, to also do some job embedded PD or, or professional development around um, virtual learning and literacy and anti-marginalization. Um, and then also to just really be able to cover when we did have vacancies. So this, the substitute teacher we felt was really important. And you're going to see that continue for next year. Next slide, Tricia. So the next one is about um, the supporting mental health. And this is no, no surprise to anyone. Um, you know, this is a combination of principals and directors, Mary Grover, Carrie Burke, all working together, trying to really determine um, what the needs are, and that is really hard during, you know, pandemic times. And so we really try to have um, the mental health supports, as you can see here, through lots of different avenues, our own staff and then community partners, because we recognize the importance and the value of making sure that we address the whole person, both staff and students, and also our community members as well. The next slide, Trisha, is the um, Essentially, the, the students that um, through SIRSA and ARP, and, and of course, even through our daily operations, right, we want to make sure that we are attending to the needs of students with disabilities, English language learners, and then um, what we've used is the term unfinished teaching and learning, right? Um, and so there were a lot of opportunities for us to be able to use these funds, and we will continue to use these funds um, to support things from um, enhanced summer programming. I know Mary's given overviews in the past, but I mean, we we have just, I think it was like tripled the number of young people that we served and we continue to do that. You will be seeing that in the budget as well. Um, you will see the enhancement of educational support professionals specifically for students with disabilities um, to be able to be available for not just the CSE and IEPs, but also um, the emotional supports, I'm sorry, the 504s and IEPs, but the emotional supports as well. Um, and then a lot of curriculum work, tremendous amounts of curriculum work to support the pillars of learning forward, right? Trisha, the next slide. So the educational technology, that's going to continue, right? We're going to ensure that um, as we sort of all come back together, We've learned that technology can be leveraged and utilized in many ways, and we want to continue to enhance that. We want to use it as a tool. We want to be able to have it there at the ready when needed, right? And we don't want to be caught by surprise. And so we have a lot of infrastructure and supports that we have been able to utilize these funds for to um, enhance our work around um, the educational technology pieces. And that's everything from people right, to infrastructure, right, to devices, um, and, and to, uh, to learning, really, to professional development. And then the next slide, Trisha, this is our last one, really, in terms of kind of the, the ways that we're allowed to use these funds. Um, and this is all of the facilities supports, right? And so, as you know, we started to look at our buildings. We want to first make sure that they are safe. Um, and so for safe buildings, we want to make sure that we have the staff um, that are in and around our buildings to be able to address the needs of our staff and our students. Um, that is through more people and also through enhanced hours, right, of our people. Um, we also want to make sure that our systems are working. So we actually do have um, contracts with outside agencies that have specialties that are beyond sort of the scope of our own workforce or that are, are supportive of the, the workforce that we have. And um, those help specifically around HVAC needs, 
and uh, many, many other um, opportunities as needed by the staff um, in, the, in the facilities departments. We also know that we're going to continue doing a lot of work outside, right, all of our outdoor learning. So we want to make sure that we have opportunities to be able to have um, things like outdoor sink rentals and stuff so that we can address both um, our, our health and wellness while we're outside, but also just up expanding those opportunities to be outdoors more and then having classrooms without walls. And then finally, we know that we have those still those trailers and sheds for storage and we're eager to get rid of those. And as we sort of are able to come back and breathe and be able to maybe find that time again and be grounded to be able to sort and purge and like look at the old things that maybe we are finally ready to get rid of, we can actually kind of get into those trailers, get rid of some of the old furniture, scrap metal, bring in some revenue, right? And so those are those are things that are yet to be done, right? That's like that closet that's, I know it's there and I just keep putting stuff in, but one day I'm gonna get to it. And our one day will be here very soon, I know. Um, and so then, you know, cleaning supplies, MERV 13s, all of that, that's, those are the, the pieces. So again, I just, I just wanna stress, it was really important for us to go through this because none of these things are going away even though they may be listed as zeros or less funding than last year, that they are going to be continuing just in a different fund, not the general fund, but actually in the special aid fund. And so I know that these are very important to many people and we felt it was really valuable before we came forward with the general fund budget to ensure that we really laid the groundwork for this special aid fund as well, so that we could understand that these two things more than ever are going to be working together. So our last slide, Tricia, is just the calendar. And we want to just keep pace, right, of sort of where are we, what are we doing? So um, finance committee is going to be a full agenda. Again, we're going to have athletics, we're going to have fun and performing arts, and we're going to have um, health and wellness, school health and wellness. We are also going to have what you would see in the budget bulletin or the budget document, right? A draft budget for the Board of Education. We'll get that out probably by the end of this week so that everybody can have time to review that. I'm gonna to try to continue to include more and more information and descriptors, right, in that so that people really have an understanding when they look at those ex that expense uh, projection, right, the budget projection, that you really understand sort of where or why or how um, uh, uh, it's developed and what it includes. Um, and then the following March 22nd, we'll have the budget presentation and review. We shift that to the following, the next the April meeting, the first April meeting. So Dr. Brown, um, Rob is always reminding me that we can always have additional meetings around budget time. I just, I just wanted to, I want to put that out there. But these are the ones that are scheduled right now. I have nothing if not flexible. That's right. And I think we did, we have talked about this in the past, right? Yeah. April 12th, per our calendar right now that we have as our meeting schedule, that would be the last meeting that we would have by law to be able to adopt. But we have up until I think the 23rd or 25th of April to be able to do that. We just don't have another meeting, board meeting scheduled um, in that time. But we want to make sure we give sufficient opportunities for people to be able um, to dialogue and, and have the opportunity to look at things. We always have let's talk, right? As soon as we put that out there, we always get some information back and we also travel. So if there's questions or you wanna host a forum around um, the budget uh, information that we share, uh, I am, we are yours. The business office is available to answer any questions as is the exec team. Um, and uh, any budget stakeholders, because by that time we will also be meeting with principals and directors directly around everything as well. Um, just, uh, just for my, well, our my our benefit. So, our first board of education meeting in April is my April twelfth. Yes, yes it is April twelfth. That is what's the, the date today. It's March. I know it is March eighth. So, but our. I, I guess I don't have the calendar in front of me. But, uh, so anyway, um, so if we don't do the budget presentation on March 22nd, then our next meeting is April 12th. Uh, that's, you're looking at budget adoption. So we're off on the 29th, um, so the Tuesday. Is so there yet another um, yeah. vacation in there somewhere? No, there are five Tuesdays in March of this year. Right, so March. And then there's Tuesday, April 5th, 
right? Which but is the first, that's the first day. That's the first, and that's right. policy and human resources. March always has lots of days. So, there you go. Um, so, um, so we do have many more Tuesdays from then till now. Right. I, um, Just not scheduled for budget purposes. For, for the board, uh, I would think that we would need to uh, have a budget presentation or review before uh, we would be expected to vote on it. Although we do budget all year round and we dig into this all the time, but um, yeah. there's not, you know, all board members need to at least have an opportunity to uh, review and uh, dig into it a bit. Mm -hmm. So just a um, uh, Every Tuesday is a, a day that we can get some work done. So um, so glad to uh, uh, to do what we have to do. The calendar changes what we uh, can schedule from time to time, and certainly it's uh, this budget is uh, they're always important. Uh, and with this again, uh, with the way that we are shifting things a bit, uh, and we can talk about that in a second. Um, so let's, so we'll, uh, um, yeah, so it'll become clear, right? Um, just so I can get things on my calendar. And I'm Thank always you. available on Tuesdays, but not everyone is. So I think that's, uh, that's my point. That's helpful at all, Dr. Yeah, very much so. Um, since I was, yep, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I'm not, I don't really know much about like, budget stuff, I guess, but what is the, like, specific reason or why we move, we're moving this federal aid from the general fund to the special aid fund? Like, what, what's the significance? Like, that's a real, it's actually, so from, from my perspective, it's really was about timing, right? So when we received the federal monies, mm -hmm. right, in SIRSA and ARP, um, the timing of it came to us when we were in budget development season. And we did not have any guidance documents from New York State about how we were expected as a school district to treat that money, okay. right? And so there was sort of, um, so we made a determination because it was, you know, $4.4 .4 million, right? We made a determination that we wanted to be really transparent and put that into the general fund, right? And show it last year in the in the budget revenue, and then also the expenditures that went with it, so that the community could understand how we were going to spend this money. Because you know, four point four million, you want some accountability. Yeah. When then we were in the budget process, guidance a do guidance document came out, and they said we actually you need to actually put that not in the general fund but the special aid fund. We had already we were already very well into the process. And we very publicly made a determination, we're going to continue with showing it. And then we made multiple announcements, I think, at all of the board meetings. Like we knew that that money then and those expenses would be transferred over to the special aid fund, right? And so you could see with the money coming in, it's actually a reimbursement. So the money would move, we'd spend it, and then we would apply for reimbursement. So this year, we're just doing the cleanup essentially. We're like, okay, it's now in special aid, it has to stay in special aid. but. I mean, I think we really always want to be transparent for people to understand that we have we have a lot of um, programs and expenses and things uh, that escalate in the general fund, and we also have these phenomenal programs in the special aid fund, which we're going to have to plan for as that money goes away. So that's that's the sort of longer answer to your question, I mean, but I think that's helpful. They made a lot of sense. Yeah. Sure. I have a question about uh, the substitutes, Amanda. That's something we haven't heard from tonight. Maybe Bob wants to chime in on that too. I didn't think our problem was not, unlike some of the other positions. My takeaway from the subs is that it wasn't a money issue, it was finding bodies. So, where are we with filling those sub ranks? Um, that would be a great question. As of January 18th, and I'm reading from the Harris document which I was able to find here. Um, the board has approved and there's onboarding of 44 subs. So that's a big really number. big yeah. difference. Yeah. And um, 31 were sub teachers, seven sub aides, which we could always use more of, uh, three sub teaching assistants and then clerical. So right. And uh 
just to the earlier point, Bob, it created to push that out to all the board members and all the student reps. Because yeah, yeah. not right, not all board members were at the HR. And although it may not be obvious, I mean that's a key to our our uh, professional development and a lot of other things we do. Mm -hmm. We can't get subs for those folks who want to train and what happens. So that's that's really great news. And one new model also was that there were building based subs. Right, so substitutes that would show up actually at a building every day and they would fill in as needed. And I think that that saved a lot of bandwidth of teachers, the stress, right, of just like, oh my goodness, like you knew that at least there was a, a building aid there to be able to backfill. And that's why I think we felt it was really important to just add that one piece um, in addition to what was online because there, we really did rely and we still do on the substitutes for sure and, and funding it through the RFS or money. Um, and uh, it's in one to uh, where I was going to go, just trying yeah. to clarify. I know that 4.3 or 4.4 million. Um, it was a part of our budget, um, but need to clarify that uh, we're going to discuss the annual meeting and propositions, et cetera. But uh, the local community doesn't vote on that 4.4 million. Correct. Really, it can't be part of the tax levy you know, or the tax rate calculation because it is separate it is federal money title title one special money so it needs to be somewhere so it doesn't contribute to uh, the tax levy calculation and so in which goes to the tax rate you know what is the budget we are voting on um, and so that's that's the important piece and just trying to figure out uh, how we're how we're doing that and instead it alluded to it you know okay there's 4.4 million that is supporting um, the kids and the programming and, and the budget for 22-23 and 23-24. Yeah. But um, half, it's almost half in 23-24, right? Because right. one of the funding streams, it will right. be its final year next year. Right, and that's the, uh, that's the issue with funding from other sources than the, uh, the local taxpayers that, uh, well, that goes away. And so, that's okay, fine. we've built in uh, 4.4, 5 million of spending on various items that we may or may not need um, in two years, or we may need it. So that has to, as you said, start walking back to the regular budget. And so there has to be a, yeah, a plan to uh, how, uh, how do we manage as we exit. And that would be, I heard, but that would be the plan I plan as part, of, as part of the overall budget process. Um, the many school districts will be saying that those programs will, will be eliminated or will go away over the next two years. We're saying we, we are saying the exact opposite. We want to sustain many of those programs, and we're going to put in front of you a plan to do so. Um, the entire budget. That's why we do multi-year budgeting. Yes. Very easy to do when you're only budgeting. Right. But so. you don't ever want. You always want to be looking ahead two, three years. We went to Hallway in 2012 when we had the last funding slip from federal funds. Right, so and we were just not avoiding that. The R funding. Questions, Nicole? Yeah. Chris is uh, Chris, your chair of the finance committee. Yeah, Chris probably could have done that for me. I didn't. I'm sure. Yeah. Went away in and uh, sure. half the way in. <laughs> Sure. I don't I don't need to weigh in. Uh, I think Amanda did a great job and we'll be talking on going to voting. Thanks, Chris. Got questions? Um, obviously this is not a full budget presentation, but we'll get to I'm not actually the full budget. Well, I, I, there was a shout out to uh, yeah, was a shout out to uh, the great uh, <laughs> Great talk that uh, your husband did uh, last week uh, at the Olympia College event. So that was uh, that was outstanding. So no questions. Props. Clear, concise. Yeah. Props to uh, Thank, um, thank you. Um, so um, anything else? I mean, we do have just a few a, a resolution and a thank you. I can just stay here in case there are questions about the legal notes. If that's Acceptable to everyone? Absolutely. Okay, great. And uh, I move resolution uh, 10.2 calling for the annual meeting and approval of the uh, annual legal notice. Second. 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 Second.
sneezes don't count, but uh, <laughs> Pat, you got it. So, um, Amanda, you just want to speak to this, and uh, some may be surprised that that annual budget vote, it's not an annual budget vote, it's the annual meeting of well, the Pacific City School District, so go ahead. And, you know, of course, even though there were many eyes editing this, I did notice one item that I'm, I'm going to ask, actually, if there is an edit to one of the things, but I will walk through it first, and then I will let you know. So, every year, um, by law, we must create a notice to the public, uh, letting them know that we will be hosting an annual meeting. And an annual meeting is actually it's an odd name because it is really the day that people go and vote, right? And so that happens each year. It's prescribed the day, it's prescribed by law, right? And you go to um, vote on not just uh, the, the budget, but you vote on propositions, right? And you also vote on who you would like to elect in your school board, okay? And so um, this is essentially, this will go out into the newspapers. Trisha is the brains behind the operation to do all this, right? And sends it out to, um, to our entities, our legal entity, our, which is, uh, I think it's the Ithaca Journal, right? Um, and this will run for a certain number of days or weeks. And, and then um, this is the announcement to the public, okay? It's pretty much the same everywhere you go. Proposition one is always, Will the, you know, the, the proposition is we would determine um, a budget number, right? Not to be exceeded. And then you ask the public, would you allow us to levy the taxes there too? Essentially, you're asking us to not to exceed this number and then we can bring in revenue from taxpayers to be able to sustain a portion of what we were expected to spend. So that's proposition number one. For us in Ithaca, Proposition number two is related to our reserve fund, our capital reserve fund, that by law you have to establish, and then by law you have to ask permission to spend from it. So we are asking to spend most of the remaining amount of money in the capital reserve fund that's existing right now to purchase school buses and to do a little bit of capital project work. That is where the edit is. We are asking to do capital project work at Northeast for interior renovations as listed and related and site work. So I just need to add the words and site work because we are going to be taking demolishing a wall, a failing wall outside the kindergarten classrooms in Northeast. And we're gonna actually create some sort of tiered seating, maybe a poured playground there so that the kindergartners have a safe space and then do some interior work as well, probably like floors or ceilings so that we can get a state aid back on our work. So we'd actually get money back. Okay. So that's proposition two. Since we are spending most of proposition two on buses and a small capital project, little related item there, proposition three will establish a new capital reserve, right? Because every, it runs out, the money runs out, and we're asking actually to fund it at $10 million. Costs have gone up, I don't know if you noticed, on everything. And so we really need to be able to have a capital reserve to purchase our buses and also, if we want to start to walk down paths like e-buses, things like that, we're going to need to be able to have a capital reserve to sustain the costs of that. And that is how we purchase buses from our capital reserve every year, as so we get voter approval for that. Proposition, um, the, the last proposition, Proposition 4, is actually about a property transfer, okay? So GIAC has been um, coming to our facilities committee meetings and discussing with us um, their uh, desire to enhance the gymnasium that was used to be used uh, for Immaculate Conception School, and they want to make a full-size gymnasium. And to do so, they actually need some property on the Beverly J. Martin campus, which is sort of like, there's like a little garden space, it's just beyond the fencing. And so there's very, there are a couple of ways that we can actually get GF our land, right? One of the easiest pathways is through voter approval right? because we're a government entity, they're a government entity. You can't just like sort of transfer land pretty, like, like a, a normal homeowner might. And so this is actually asking permission from the community and they would vote on this as well to allow for us to be able to transfer um, that land, a, pro a real property transfer over to GIAC. Yeah? Can you tell me the 
correction again and proposition three uh it is for proposition two, two. and so it's at the bottom of i believe it's at the bottom of that first page and it says um uh interior, interior renovations, renovations and site, site work, work at northeast North elementary school thank you john and i think that's the only place that i noticed that and as uh, and after we vote with that edit, uh, it will be added, and we would expect to see that on the ballot for that annual meeting. And I know this will be a conversation when it comes up, but it'd be important for folks to know that the Greater Ithaca Activity Center has been working on this gym for multiple years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, would greatly enhance their capacity to serve uh, the residents of the city of Ithaca. Um, and if folks have, we've talked about it at, at facilities, folks can see the plans that are there. Uh, it's a pretty exciting venture, particularly given some of the additional construction that's taking place um, on that block as well. So I would encourage folks to <coughs> take a look at previous facility committee meetings. Very good, appreciate it. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Regarding propositions, we're going to touch base on them again. So uh, it was moved and seconded, I believe. And Trisha, if you could call the roll, that'd be great. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicola Fay? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Patricia Wagner? Yes. So very good. And one more uh, policy. Um, uh, policy 1400 about public comments. The changes that are here uh, for the most part are simply to change the titles and to reflect our current practice. Uh, this policy, uh, as many of our policies have been somewhat outdated and did not include updated titles and the direction of how uh, public comments and or complaints should proceed. That's an omnibus policy 1400 public comments and complaints uh, to the Board of Education for uh, a vote, a uh, second reading, and adoption this evening. Second. Second by Pat. Uh, this has been uh, reviewed multiple times, I believe, multiple times on and off, but uh, now we're ready for, uh, ready to vote. I Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, where do we kind of put this whole system slash structure in terms of say we have new families coming to the district? Is there a way that this is like an orientation package or are we expecting it just to be online? It already is on the website. I'm trying, it may not be the easiest to find, but I know I was able to find it on the website. Mary, do you know? I'm sorry to call you out, but I don't know if you know where it's located. Oh, I think it may find be. Find it. Yeah. Sean, you can list policies off the top of your head. Well, this one we had some conversations, um, right. so I will find it and make sure. Um, one of the consistent concerns about policy is that it becomes difficult to find. Our policies are searchable. That's one of the good things about being online. The other good thing about, or the flip side, is that it's an expectation that people have access to being online as well. So we used to have a policy book, which was even more inaccessible. And so we're going back and forth. Um, I will find that link to where it is exactly and, and let you know. No, thanks, Sean. Yeah. Um, yep. Go ahead, Mary. Under the student staff, is the access for resources, the whole rest of the resources. It includes this, correct, the right, this document. And I would just like to clarify that this, this um, policy on public comments and complaints to the Board of Education has nothing to do with the public comment period within board meetings. Um, it is really about complaints of specific individuals about a school practice or, or, or an individual employee, something going on, staff member, um, and, and the public comments section of the, of the board meeting is not the place to bring those. We try to resolve that at the school, let, let the school resolve itself at that level. But if that is not effective, then this is just a kind of chain of command uh, list. You're any specific students, so yes. yes. <coughs> Any 
We good? Anything else? Um, who seconded it? Trisha? Good. Robbie. Oh. Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell. Yes. Eldred Harris. Yes. Nicole LaFave. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Patricia Watson. Yes. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're pretty close. Um, other items, Sector Brown? Okay. Nothing today. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? We all good. Thanks again to uh, Beverly J. Martin, fifth graders, and uh, soon to be fifth graders that are younger that were um, very much involved in that. Future so we'll... boy guts. Future boy guts. Oh, yeah. So there you go. Exactly. Uh, perfect. So uh, without further ado, thanks, everybody. We're, we are done.